Thank you, thank you. Nice to see you all here, second day morning, ready to continue. Uh, yeah, so let's talk Gutenberg and collaboration, these two things. Um, do we have a presentation already? Somewhere? <laughs> okay, we have to wait. But you can watch me, at the, you know, in, in the meantime. Uh, I will maybe start, since we have no slides yet. Do we? No. So, why am I actually talking about this? There are two main reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm a huge fan of Gutenberg, uh, the project Gutenberg, from the day one that it was created. And second of all, I was working as a JavaScript technical lead at CK Source, where I was heavily exposed to uh, collaboration and collaborative editing in the web browser, in the JavaScript. Oh yeah, we have this. So, it's me, I'm David Urbanski, I'm a full-stack web developer, WordPress developer for many, many, many years, tech lead. I'm a huge fan of Gutenberg, React, TypeScript, JavaScript, everything web development related. And as I already told you, I love Gutenberg, and I worked as a JavaScript technical lead. All right, and I was so heavily now I will show you to, two to a collaborative editing experience in the web. Also, long-term roadmap for Gutenberg states four phases. First is the easier editing, which is the Gutenberg editor itself. Second one is the customization. It includes, uh, for example, block patterns, block themes, block directory, and full-site editing. I had to check this out. Uh, third phase is the collaboration. We will be uh, just touching this a bit today. And phase four is my personal, personal favorite. It's a native support for multilingual in WordPress and Gutenberg. Phase two is still in progress. If you want to check what still needs to be done, you can check this issue on GitHub in the Gutenberg repository. And kind of unrelated, but one of the most favorite features of mine in this phase two Gutenberg is this command center feature, which is basically like a spotlight for Gutenberg and WordPress so you can add stuff quickly and do stuff or even in the WordPress admin eventually just by hitting a shortcut and doing what you want. So let's first start with basics. So collaboration, what is actually collaboration? Collaboration is when multiple people are working together to achieve one goal. And what the goal is in context of Gutenberg? The goal is to create or produce content. So it could look like this. In like bigger companies con producing content, it could look like this. We have editing part where multiple, multiple people are editing the content and they are creating it, editors. Then eventually they m optionally may pass this to another stage like correction and then maybe compliance to the legal team if we are working on, for example, terms of service page. And then maybe we have someone who can approve the changes. And once all of this is done, we have ready to publish page. So we can tell that all of these people have collaborated to create this publishable version of the page. Real-time collaboration, on the other hand, is just an extension of collaboration. It, it is the same thing, but allows you to do this simultaneously. In our case, a great place where we could put real-time collaboration is the editing part. So instead of people passing the document to each other so they can apply more changes, they can just do it simultaneously, which would be great, like Google Docs, wouldn't it? Basically, the idea is to just get rid of this, of this post lock model. Instead, we want to allow everyone in and enjoy editing the content at the same time. Still, there is no real-time collaboration without collaboration, so it would be great to have these flows of collaboration in Gutenberg before going real-time collaboration full. Now let's get into some specifics. These solutions for uh, collaboration, they usually are network layer agnostic, but when you try to implement this in a real product, which Gutenberg is, you probably just stick to one of the connection methods. So we could use like one of these short or long polling with traditional HTTP requests, similar to what Heartbeat API is doing in WordPress. We can open a WebSocket to the server, and we can use WebRTC to just connect people in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Speaking of peer-to-peer, -peer, should we use server or peer-to-peer -peer network? This illustrates the difference. So in peer-to-peer, -peer, obviously, we connect everyone uh, directly to each other. This has an advantage because there is no server in the middle. But you, you might already tell that adding such a synchronization in such a decentralized network 
is probably a bit more difficult than normal. On the other hand, we have a ser central server in the middle, which really reduces the problem of synchronization because we have one central server, which is a single source of true, but we now have a server. So now we also have to ask other questions like where this server should live. Should this live alongside with the web website? If yes, it's probably have to be written in PHP, which is, trust me, not an easy task to create a web, uh, webhook server with PHP. If not, alongside with the web website, then when, where? Maybe an external server or network of geolocalized servers hosted by someone like maybe Automatic or WordPress org. But then we enter into a data privacy issues because all of the data is flowing through those external servers. So we need to probably have some encryption. Some advantages, again, some disadvantages. If we are working in a system where multiple machines are connected across the network, it's unavoidable to stumble across concurrency. So let's see this very simple diagram. We have two timelines and two nodes. Node A sends some information to node B, and node B sends some information to node A. Then they receive one and the another. And when we look at this from an external actor perspective, us, we know the absolute order of all of these events, the total order, because we see both of the timelines. We know that node A I mean, the A1 happened first, then B1 happened second, A1 prime happened third, and the last one is B1 prime. But if we look only at the one node perspective, let's, let's look at the node B, and let's think only based on the information he has, can we figure out the whole order I just told you? If you know, probably you know, since I'm asking, the answer is no, and it is no, because if we look at this and from the node B perspective, what is the difference between this from, for him and this? Node, node B timeline didn't even move. It's the same for him. And this is all the information he has. So going this and this changes nothing to him. So what we are saying that A1 and B1, these changes are incomparable. So therefore they are concurrent. So you, at this moment, you might say, well, just use timestamps. Just send it when this happened. And I, I, I don't have time to enter into these timestamps uh, and clocks in general. But if, if you all want to like, get into this stuff, ask me about this on the, in the QA session. But trust me if I'm saying yeah, if you have multiple machines, you cannot rely on the physical clock they are operating with. Also, there is this misconception that you can just avoid concurrency altogether by just using a server. And this is simply not true. Let's see the same exact example we had before. And what we just do, let's just change the labels. Let's say the top one is Jane, the editor, and the bottom one is the server. So as you can see, we have still the same situation. We have still have concurrency. The only difference is that it's between the client and the server. And if you think about it for a second, it's great because we still, again, reduced the concurrency issue to only two actors. And you might also think, how is it even possible that the server has some concurrent changes to James? Well, it could receive it from another node that is also connected to the server. And as a byproduct, we also have a, a single source, source of truth on the server about the total order of events. Because for the server, the order is basically whenever I received the event is the order of the operations. And this will be important later. For the comparison, this is the decentralized network example. We are sending all the information to all the nodes. We have only clients. There's no server now. But, and the sending part, by the way, it looks uh, complicated, but it's, it can be simply handled by WebRTC, for example. So it's not an issue. But the problem is the ordering of these events. How do you can ensure that all of the clients, all of the nodes have the same content in the end? It's a difficult problem to solve, but we'll get to this. So handling concurrent editing ideally should have two main properties, which is strong eventual consistency. That basically means that at some point in time, in the future, all of the nodes that are connected, they end up with the same content. That's as simple as this. The second one is a bit more tricky to implement, which is intent preservation. So what we are saying is that we, when we, someone edits the content and someone else edits the content, when we merge those changes, we don't want to just merge them wherever. We want to have some intent preservation. So we have two words. We don't want this 
these letters to interleave, for example, just creating gibberish. We want to have two words one by one. Even if they are in the wrong order, that's still fine because it's easily fixable. But if the letters interleave, there's no intent preservation and it's obviously bad. So are there any solutions already created by the, by the people? And they are. Two types of solutions are OT and CRDT. If you don't know what it is, bear with me, I will explain this in a moment. So OT stands for operational transformation, and it's like super, super, super old piece of algorithms, ideas, software, and all the stuff around it. And most notably, it's being used by Google Docs, for example, and CK Editor 5. So how does this actually work? Let's see this diagram. And let's imagine both of these nodes, they have some content in the editor, A, B, C, and D. Now, node 1 wants to insert X between C and D, and node B wants to remove B, basically. So now they end up with the content A, B, C, X, and D, and on the right, A, C, D. Now they exchange information, what I have done. And the first node says, insert X at index 3, and the second node says, delete B at index 1. Now when we received this operation, we pass it to a, tr some transformation function. This, and this function is clever enough to know, oh, the B is still on the index 1, nothing has changed it, so just do nothing with this transformation. Do not do this operation. Do not transform it. And we end up with the con applying delete B uh, at index 1 as is. And the result is A, C, X, and D. On the other hand, we have the same exact transformation function, but now it's clever enough again to know, oh, something has changed, and just basically we have to account for this change in our uh, operation. So we transform it, and we say instead of index uh, insert X on index 3, we now we have to insert X on index 2, which ends up again with A, C, X, and D. There are multiple... Uh, multiple algorithms created for uh, these OT solutions, but they're true to be told. As you can see, the OT is very old because it uh, even have some stuff from 80s. But mo most of these have been proven to be just straight wrong uh, for some situations, and the only two I know are um, correct are the highlighted, the, one, the ones highlighted on the slide, and the, they both use server in the middle, and the Jupyter one is used by Google Docs. So I already told you that order matters, but what if all operations are commutative? So what does it mean? Uh, in mathematics, it's very, it's very simple to explain. Commutative means no matter what, which order you apply the operations, the, 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 the result is the same, basically. So we can shift operations and we have the same result. So let's, let's see if our operational transformation is commutative. Imagine we are creating a title for this whole conference. And we start with the word camp word in the editor. I want to insert hello at the beginning, and you want to insert rules at the end. We ex we, if we represent these changes as operations and then exchange them, now let's apply the, the first one, hello, insert hello at index zero. So index zero is here at the beginning. We inserted hello word camp rules, all good. And now let's do the opposite one, and you probably see where this is going. The index 8 is now between O and R, which we, and we end up with hello world rules or the camp, which is basically wrong. So both of these content diverged, and they, this is basically like a critical error of the system, and they will never get back. They will never converge. So what we are saying, that these two operations are not commutative. We cannot apply them in any order because the result will be the, um, different. And that's the main reason why we need these transformation functions in the first place. And just to say also about these transformation functions, this is the main criticism of OT. Because those transformation functions are very complex. They are full of magic in direction because they they, what they do is they transform operations against, against another operation. So you have often like a chain, transform operation, then transform operation, then transform this operation, then transform this operation. And we have like very long chains that nobody is able to debug or even understand the code that is uh, creating these transformations and also to foresee the result of this code, which is pretty bad. If they would be commutative, it would be more like this. We start with the same state, an empty document. We have three operations. We shuffle them, doesn't matter the order, and then we end up with the same uh, result. 
if they also are idempotent, which is a big word, but it's pretty simple. It means that no matter how many times we apply the operation, we end up with the same result. So multiplying by one is idempotent operation because we can multiply by 100,000 times and we have the same uh, result. In our operational transformation world or CRDTs, if we have operations like this and we somehow receive the same operation twice, exactly the same, we only apply it once and we have one paragraph with text hello in this example. So if we would have a system where we have operations that are commutative, both commutative and idempotent, we have a very simple way to synchronization. Because think of this, if I can send anything in any order to anyone and they receive it, and we don't even care if they received it multiple times, it would be pretty simple, yeah? I mean, here we enter CRDTs, which stands for conflict-free replicated data types, also known as commutative replicated data types or convergent replicated data types. This one is the most popular. And CRDTs are the set of data structures and also algorithms and, again, stuff around this to basically enable this commutative, idempotent, everything is going, you know, merging itself, hence conflict-free. Some advantages of this are, for example, you can create a software that is uh, ready for offline editing, aka local first apps. So you can have two different editors that are completely offline. We, I do changes, you do changes, and then once we are online, somehow it magically merges. It supports both operation-based and state-based things, so we can both use the normal operations as I sh showed you in the operational transformation, or we can just send the whole state of the application and they are be will be getting merged. This is obviously more expensive payload-wise, but it's also an option. And there is no need for the server because we don't care about the order of operations, so we can send it to anyone uh, at will. Some of the solutions and algorithms for CRDTs are listed here. This, these are the ones that I know. And the, I'm not going to go into details about this, but the WOOD, the first one is pretty funny because it stands, the, 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 this abbreviation stands for without operational transformation. So you can see that this, is, this has been created just to kill the operational transformation. And it's like a new and more fancy way of doing collaboration these days. So how actually these CRDTs work? Because you might think it's kind of difficult. Like I sent any order, any du you know, duplications, and it still somehow works. So how actually does this work? I will give you an example of one of the algorithms. There are multiple ways of doing this, but this one is the simplest one to, to explain, so I will get this one. In CRDTs, if we have, again, the same content A, B, C, and D, we, instead of working and operating on indexes, which may shift, we operate on IDs, on unique IDs. So in this case, I, I made these IDs 1, 2, 3, and, and 4. So now, well, if I want to insert X between C and D, well, there's no ID there because it's 3 and 4. Uh, what do you do? You just create a new ID in the middle, 3.5. And now you might think, okay, but if two people want to insert between C and D, they both have ID 3.5, which is bad. We don't want this. And yes, you, you, you would be true because it's not that simple. I will explain this on this example. Let's say we have a collaborative session between John and Jane, and John have created some content first, A, B, C, and D. And now you can see instead of just uh, adding ID as a number, what we are doing is we have an array of tuple. Tuple, tuple is basically two value array, let's say, two value uh, data structure. So we now have ID of like index or ID of this element, and also an ID of who actually created this. So in this case, I'm using emojis because it's shorter, but we know that one index one created, I mean, ID one created by John, ID two created by John, three created by John, and four created by John. And now, if Jay wants to insert something between C and D, she's no longer need to shift and start do stuff with indexes. What she does is she takes whatever was before, three by John, and now she appends it, and she says, this is three by John followed by one at, at me, by me. And now let's go even deeper, like, like now we're removing B, the same situation we had before, removing B, and now John wants at the same time insert X, Y and Z between X and D. So what do we do? 
we just wait, remove the two by John, and the John inserts after X, so it takes whatever was there, and it adds Y and Z, adding one and two by him at the end. So this way, we have like conflict-free merging of the letters. Uh, there's also one, uh, and by the way, these, uh, these fraction numbers I just showed, like 3.5, they are actually um, created by taking all of these numbers in the ID. So it's 3.1.1 for the white le Y letter, and therefore we can order all of this based on these values. There's also one edge case for this. Let's imagine I removed C as a John, and I added D also as a John. So we would have, again, the same situation, but different letter, and this would be bad. So what we are doing, we are just using something called logical clock or, or just counter, basically, and every time we do any operation, we bump the counter, which is kind of like a timestamp for us. And the whole thing, the whole row is actually the ID. The whole row is the ID of, of the letter. The two main known uh, libraries or software that is actively using in real pro projects uh, CRDTs is AutoMerge and YJS. And now, you can just Google this and find this on GitHub. Now let's go, we, we talked basics. We talked how collaboration actually works. Now let's talk Gutenberg. If we look at this issue, it's actually from 2017. So it's six years ago already and people were discussing collaboration. And if you look closely here, we also have a mention of operational transforms. It's, it's also sometimes called like this, and CRDTs. And they also say peer-to-peer, -peer, by the way. It's six years ago already. Uh, and it's by Chris Blower uh, from Automatic. He's still working there, legend. Then, in, uh, around the same time, uh, a guy called Abhishek Galot, back then working at Automatic, he created this proof of concept using WebRTC. And then it was taken also by Grzegorz Jukowski from Automatic and put into the uh, WordPress um, repository to, to WordPress issues. And it was, uh, at some point, it was closed. But it was nice proof of concept. Then the guy who created YJS, which his name is Kevin Jans, he actually cre took YJS, which is exactly what they do. They take YJS and put it into all of the editors, WYSIWYG editors. And he took took YJS and said, okay, if I can add this to any editor, I can also add this to Gutenberg. And he created this proof of concept. And if you are paying attention, there's a link here. Uh, and it's live. It's still live. It's 2019, but it's still live. You can go there and you can check collaboration in Gutenberg right now, if you want. In 2020, this is the latest take on uh, collaboration. As you can see, something is going on, although we don't have the phase three yet. This is the latest take. It's uh, created by Enrique Piqueras, who back then worked at Automatic, now he works at Google. But I took this uh, GIF, by the way, excuse me the uh, quality, because it was just downloaded from the comment on the pull request. But you can see how does this work on this pull request, and it's you know, kind of impressive. You type something, uh, other person sees this, you can comment on stuff, etc. And this is using also YJS, so it's using CRDTs. It's kind of superseded the previous pull request I told you from the YJS uh, creator. There's also this asblocks.com created by uh, Riyad Benguela, who also works at Automatic. And this is not embedded in Word WordPress, but you can, he took just, just the Gutenberg and created this a nice uh, piece of software where you can create a session, you can share it, you can visit the link in another browser, and suddenly you have collaborative editing enabled in both of these uh, Gutenberg editors. Until now, I was talking only about uh, like text editing, mostly because it was simple enough to explain, but it's nice to, to know that CRDTs also can handle like diff all of the different uh, types of data. For example, this is showing the offline capabilities on a to-do app, which is probably just a JSON under the hood. It's just sh sharing the state and merging it somehow auto-magically after they, they you know, change the toggle to online from offline, which is super cool. So 
exciting times to get ahead of us, amazing times ahead of us. I truly believe that adding collaboration, real-time collaboration to Gutenberg is going to be the biggest milestone that WordPress had to face and will actually achieve since the creation of Gutenberg itself. Oh, you got a problem? But the next slide is thank you. Yeah, something popped up here. Uh, but the next slide is thank you, so that's it from me. Thank you, David. That was an awesome talk. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has questions, again, we have the mics in the oh. aisles. If you want to ask a question, just please proceed to either of the two sides. Um, this was very exciting to watch, especially the last GIF, uh, showing how it could work. Uh, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait, too. <laughs> I mean, it will be awesome. Yes, yes. I think we have a question over there. Uh, hello. Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> I have a question. How will this influence uh, database and also revisions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Thanks. it's a good point. It's a good point. So it has to all, oh, oh, you probably know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, it obviously has to be integrated somehow with revision history uh, to, for, uh, and what was the first one? Can you, can you, can you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know answer to this, to be honest. Uh, I'm not working at Automatic. I, I did my due diligence, uh, and I spoke to people working at Automatic. Thank you, by the way, thank you, Adam Chenisky. But I don't, know, I don't have answers to like, all of this, because I'm not like, ex very close to this uh, development cycle of Gutenberg. But I can check this one, and I know there is like, a revision history feature, and all of the f other features like suggestions, like uh, con content locking, so it w should also work with like locking the templates and everything. So you, some people can edit some stuff, some people can't. So this also should be aware of all of this, which is not an easy task. That's why we only have proof of concepts. We don't have the real, real thing yet. But you know, hopefully at some point in the future we will get this. Also, I know from the inside that, to be absolutely honest, I, I'm not representing automatic, but I know that. The real-time collaboration is not like super main priority. The, the off, uh, async flows for content teams is kind of like more important thing for automatic for the collaboration part because they don't specify real-time collaboration. They are working on it, looking at it, but the async collaboration is the is the the main priority because you now the the bigger bigger content teams they are using external tools they create content there and they just move it to the wordpress in the end which is not ideal uh, so yeah any more questions from the audience it looks like okay thank you very much david that was amazing please everybody give it up for david <clears throat>